What does the word hallelujah mean? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Joy and I have often talked that we uh, want that song at our funerals. We hope it's no time soon. But that is a powerful anthem, one of our favorite songs of all time. That was sung at Molly and Crispin's wedding by a young girl, who, a friend of ours from Winston-Salem, who had moved to Texas and came back to Myrtle Beach for the wedding. But it's a statement, isn't it? Straight from Psalm 8, as Harry said. Let's pray together as we've heard that beautiful anthem. Lord, uh, those words from Scripture and that beautiful uh, composition by the one who wrote the music and all of the, the blessings that we've enjoyed already today through music. We look into your word for strength and truth as Joe read the powerful passage today. And we ask now that you would bless this whole world to praise you, to sing and live Alleluia every day because we know in doing that, praising you, we can be lifted from the darkness to the light of heaven. And we thank you for the light that you give us each day as we journey. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to congratulate someone who's very blessed today, and that's uh, Mary Louise Hill. She is a new great-grandmother. Little Bo, true luck, last name is, his last name? Bo, Bo he's calling Bo true luck, but his last name is? I'm trying to think too. <laughs> well, we congratulate the, the sweet family. I'll tell you, I've got it right here. It's um, Stevens, Stevens. There you go. <laughs> well, he's a precious baby. I saw those pictures and congratulations. And to them, we thank God for them too. Today, as, as we think about um, this new little life out in uh, Colorado to Anna and uh, Tim, and the grandson of Diane and L.R. Perry, uh, we're thankful for life itself. But as we, as we think back on 9-11, I'm sure uh, all of us have some very sad memories of that day. And we, as I said earlier, know where we were and what we were doing. It's kind of like when President Kennedy was assassinated. We know where we were and what we were doing if we were alive uh, at that time. And as I think about that national tragedy, I'm, I'm reminded today that we have to remember that, lest we forget that that happened as some people who had an evil purpose to take, come and take innocent lives. And we must remember that we are in a battle of light versus darkness, of Satan and evil versus God and good. And we must remember lest we forget. But tonight in our evening service, I want to continue this thought about remembering and forgetting but also for forgiving, not only in the 9-11 incident, but also in our personal lives and even in the life of First Baptist Church of Florence. We'll look at that tonight. But the phrase, lest we forget, and the phrase that we read in the scripture today, coming from scripture from, uh, that, jo that Joe read so beautifully, are reminders to us that God's word speaks to us. You may have often heard this, this phrase, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it inspiring? Is it beneficial to all concerned? Is it helpful? Does it improve on the silence? And if the answer is no, someone said, maybe what you're about to say should be left unsaid. Now that phrase, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Has been attributed to Socrates. It's been attributed to an Arabian proverb. It has been Per, uh, attributed to an American lawyer, Bernard Meltzer. And I'm not really sure where it came from, but I think it's also the theme of one of our social clubs like Rotarians or Kiwanis. I have seen it on billboards before, but I can't really say where it came from. But it's kind of those phrases that Paul was saying to, to the church that we should remember what we say is very, very important. Matthew 12, 35 says, a good man out of the treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart brings forth evil things. Or in other words, what goes in will come out. Computer lingo today says, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. What we think 
we become, what we think in our minds and our hearts, we are. Bill Mitchell is a friend of ours. He was a member of our church at First Baptist Myrtle Beach. He's now moved to the upstate in Traveler's Rest near Greenville. Uh, he and his wife, Mary, and Joy and I worked on a, a project together called Building Strong Families. He's written several books. He's, he's known around the country, but he's a very humble man who also uh, came from very impoverished background by his own admission. But God has used him to teach thousands of people about building strong families. And he said it this way. He said, our thoughts determine our actions. Our actions determine our behavior. Our behavior determines our habits. And our habits that we develop lead to our character. Think about that. Thoughts, actions, behavior, habits, character. Say it with me, please. Thoughts, actions, behavior, habits, character. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 3.19, 23.19, hear thou my son and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. And then we're told today in that wonderful scripture, think, think on these things. What does to think really mean? It means your mind is occupied in, on some certain subject. And sometimes we are called multitasking or multi-thinking, but oftentimes we can only stay focused on one thought at a time and then deal with it appropriately. But it's to have an idea. To think is to resolve ideas in the mind. To think is to imagine, to suppose, to fancy, to muse about, to meditate or to reflect on, to recollect or to call to mind, to consider to deliberate doing something, to think about it, and it is a decision you have to make. Thinking is what everyone is doing right now, unless you've already gone to sleep. And, but to think is what God gives us the ability in our minds to contemplate what our actions are going to be. So what are the things that Paul was saying that we should think on? What should we meditate on? What are these definite patterns that he would tell us that are very important for us to, to bring into our actions that determine our behavior, our habits, and our character? First of all, he said, think on the things that are true. Think on the truth. And the Bible is truth. We, we read it. We pledge it, our allegiance to it. We say, may, you, may we hide your words in our heart that we may not sin against you, O God, because your word, we pledge it, is a light into our path and a light into our, our way and a light into our path. So we think the Bible is truth, but we also know that Jesus Christ is the truth. And there are many people in this world today who are saying there is no truth. What is truth? We who believe in Christ can say without a doubt and with certainty, we have found the truth. We have found the way. We have found the life and the one who gives us eternal life. The Bible is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the church should be the pillar of truth where the gospel of truth is preached. Some churches have gotten away from the word of God and gotten away from the truth of Jesus Christ, but the truth should be proclaimed. And that's why church is very relevant and important today, even though some people feel it's, there's no more use for the church. Bible reading, study, truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It says not only think on truth, but think on what is honest. Think on what is honest. Have you ever heard the phrase, honesty is the what policy? Best policy. Really, honesty is the only policy. If you find someone who is not honest with you, you have found either someone who's lying or cheating or stealing or a crook or somebody who's going to try to pull the rug out from under you. Honesty really is the best policy, but honesty should be the only policy, especially for us as believers. Who is the father of lies? None other than Satan himself. Satan is the father of un dishonesty and, and untruth. God is not the author of confusion. He is the author of peace and happiness. He is life itself and the gifts that we 
receive from him or his gifts to us of, of eternal life. Have you ever noticed years ago there was a book entitled Riots, Rhythms, and Revolutions? Say it with me, please. Riots, Rhythms, and Revolutions. And the context of that book is that many of the riots in the world back then, in the, the 60s, were being caused by the rhythms, the music that were driving p people to riot, and it was leading to revolutions in all kinds of places. You don't even need the music today. There's so many riots and disapproval of the government and disapproval of things that are going on. The riots and rhythms and revolutions are still happening. Can you think of how that is so different from the lyrics of Christian music? If this world could sing fairest Lord Jesus, if this world could hear the majesty and glory of your name, how that brings us into the presence of God, which is so, such a contrast to what the lyrics and the music are on the radio stations today. The Christian lyrics are those of peace and love and joy and light and blessed assurance in Jesus Christ, of faith and hope and heaven that we can have here on earth and heaven for hereafter. These are the honest gifts of the faith. The third one is what, think on these things that are truth, think on these things that are just, honest, think on these things that are just. That's one of our main favorite scriptures. Remember, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Justice meaning equality, what is fair, what is Jesus' words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the just thing, that's the fair thing, not to try to get back at somebody. The, third, the fourth one is purity. Whatsoever things are pure, think on these things. Remember garbage in, garbage out. We bring it in, we think about it, it leads to actions of garbage in, garbage out. It leads to our behavior. Have you ever, ever noticed that how someone would try to be moral in their language and some, suddenly they become uh, very comfortable with using either slang terms or curse words or profanity? Before they know it, it becomes crass. Their language, we, language becomes evil. It becomes hateful. Language can become vile and impure and dirty and obnoxious and judgmental. Language can become disrespectful to the person that you're trying formally to respect. It can become sin-filled, devil-honoring, and it's like an event I had when I was in college. There was a young man who worked with me in a magnolia finishing plant, a division of Millican in Blacksburg. I worked midnight till eight in the morning. Then if they needed extra help, I'd stay till noonday, go home and eat and sleep and get up and go to work at midnight that night. I saved money for college that year because I didn't have time to do anything else. I would eat and sleep and work. But there was a young man in the lab where I worked and he cursed continuously. Well, I didn't want to come across as a Pollyanna or a goody two-shoes, but his language really bothered me. And I said one day to him, I said, where, where do you go to church? He said, oh, I go to First Baptist Church of Gaffney. I was at First Baptist Church of Blacksburg, and I thought to myself, well, they didn't teach us to talk that way. People did it, but not to be proud that where you went to church, and then you, you be, be lie it or betray it. And I said, uh, oh, and you're, you're, a, you're a believer. We started talking about faith. Yeah, but almost every other word was not pure. It was cursing and taking the Lord's name in vain. And, and I thought, I, this is just too much. So you know what I started doing in the lab? I started whistling, how great thou art, the hymn. And this young man who had been cursing and using impure language, I didn't want to come across as goody two-shoes and trying to judge him, but I just started singing songs or humming songs or, or whistling, How Great Thou Art. And I listened out in the lab, and there he was humming. There he was whistling one day, and I thought at least his mind is on praising God, How Great Thou Art, instead of using the words that so easily slipped out of his mouth and off his tongue. You hear it on television, you hear it on the news, you hear violence and hate and garbage coming in that is not pure, it's poisonous. 
And 100% of what God wants is us to be pure in our honoring him with our words and with our actions. A pure mind he spoke of in this scripture. He also next speaks about those things that are lovely. Jesus is love incarnate. And as we think about that phrase, what would Jesus do? Jesus would always want us to love. WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would we do? Put our names in the blank. We would always love. We would have love in our actions, our deeds, our thoughts. We would always show mercy. We would also give people forgiveness and we would give people a second chance. When they've wronged us, we would forgive them to the point that we can understand maybe why they made a decision that they did at that time. But now let's forgive them and move on. What would God have us to do to be lovely toward him and toward each other? It also talks about those things that are of good report. Good report, not negative report. Positive reports, these things that are building up to someone and not build, bringing them down. So often in this world, we hear the negatives, but in Jesus' spirit and in the name of Jesus, we are to be positive and always lifting someone else, seeing the good in them and good in all people rather than the negative that would bring them down. And we need to learn to give the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume or perceive something wrongly or negatively. We had a man in our church in Myrtle Beach and we went to Denny's in Florida. And I will never forget having a wonderful time with this senior adult group in uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. It was called Seniors in the Sun, S-O-N, Seniors in the Sun. And uh, we were having a good time at this all-night restaurant, 24-hour restaurant at Denny's in Daytona Beach, Florida. And the waitress simply came up to us and said, is there anything else I can do for you? Uh, is, can, may I get you any more coffee or anything else late that night? And this man in our group looked up to her and said, what do you mean? He didn't hear well. He said, what do you mean? He said, if you were in Myrtle Beach, we wouldn't run you out of our place like you're doing us. And we were all shocked. We said, Harvey, uh, she's not running us out. She's just asking, is there anything else she can do for us? He had, he had misunderstood. He went, oh, that same man, gentleman, came to the church one day and he would come by constantly, which is good, which was great. He was a supporter of the church, supporter of me as his pastor. But he came by one day to the, to the church and uh, he told, a lay, told his Sunday school class something that wasn't true. And one of the ladies in our church came to me and said, uh, Harvey told us this about you. I said, no, that's, that's not the truth. And, and I said, I'll, I'll try to straighten it out. And what had happened, he had asked me to call his granddaughter, and I did. And rather than just taking it at face value that I would keep my word, he got in front of his whole Sunday school class and told them that the pastor had not done what he had asked me to do in calling his granddaughter who was in a bad situation and wanted me to do more than, than I had done. So the girl came to me and said, is there something I can help you do as, as you deal with all this situation? I said, no, I said, uh, I'll, I'll straighten it out. So the next day he came to me and uh, came to the church and I just simply said, Harvey, uh, I need to speak to you a minute. I took him in the office privately and I said, I heard that you were uh, talking to somebody, this lady, about something I hadn't done. I said, um, did you tell her that I hadn't done what I should have done about her granddaughter? Make a phone call? He said, yeah. I didn't just tell her. I told the whole Sunday school department. Was that helpful to anybody? No. Did it help me? No. I said, Harvey, let me tell you this. I loved him to pieces. He was very, he was a deacon. He was one of our most active members. He was faithful to every service. But I said, now Harvey, was that the right thing to do? I said, I called your granddaughter. She told me she had everything settled. She didn't need me to come over or to talk with me. I prayed with her on the phone, but I offered to go to her house. And she said, no, it's not necessary. I said, I'm sorry that it got everything stirred up with people that people came and talked to me about it. He said, no, I don't guess that was right. But you know what I think about? It's when we think about good report, 
we want to give the benefit of the doubt. We want to give the person the best benefit before we spread rumors about them. I came back from Boone, North Carolina to help with that young man's funeral, elderly man. He was a, one of my favorite people in the world, but he had opened his mouth with falsehood, in the wrong timing, and with wrong information. Are you telling good reports about First Baptist Church of Florence? Are you doing the positive things about First Baptist Church of Florence? Or are we sometimes still caught so much in the past that we can't get over it, that we can't move forward with the good things that God wants to do in this church and in the lives of his people? Be one who cancels negativity with a good report. Our little grandson had somebody in North Carolina. They moved from Myrtle Beach to Silva, North Carolina. And there was a little bully in his class. And no matter what little Ty did, this little bully would bully him in front of other students and put him down. And his mother got word of this, our older daughter, Mary Beth, and she said, well, Ty, if that little boy keeps bullying you, uh, just say, uh, I'm sorry, and I'll make up this name. Uh, I'm sorry, Billy. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way about me. I always thought you were a cool kid or a cool person. Well, the next time the little bully came up with his negative comments about the little grandson and his words were not too kind or nice to him, our little grandson said, I'm sorry, Billy, I'll say whatever his name was. I always thought you were cool. The little boy didn't know what to say. He backed down and they became the best of friends. Negative turned to positive. There may be somebody in this church, days past, days present, days to come, that you just don't see eye to eye about, but you do not need to be negative. You need to remember giving people the benefit of the doubt and don't assume wrongly or negatively toward somebody. There's a famous scene in, in Peter Pan when he's in the children's bedroom, the fairy tale Peter Pan. They have seen him flying and they all want to fly too. They've tried to fly from the floor, they've tried to fly from their beds and the result is always failure. How do you do it? Little John asked Peter Pan in this child's fable. Peter answered, you just think lovely, wonderful thoughts and they lift you up in the air. This is unrealistic, maybe physically, except for Peter Pan, of course, but it is realistic for the believer. The only way to defeat the evil thoughts that would destroy us, destroy the church, destroy the, the kingdom's work in a negative way is for us to let the evil thoughts become victorious in our minds and our hearts rather than asking God to help us think positively about others, ourselves, and our church. I found in my life that Jesus Christ will lift us higher than we ever dreamed we could go. Jesus Christ will lift us from the mundane to the majestic, and Jesus Christ will lift us from the mud of the valley to the mountaintops of heights of victory, from the pits of despair to the heights of glory. That's what this beautiful anthem said today. The majesty and glory of his name is what gives us hope even in the darkness of this world. So today, as we think about what God wants us to do and to be, we can be victorious as we think on these things from a God who has gifted us with salvation and loves us eternally in Jesus Christ. There's an old hymn that I'd like to close with this morning, and it's, it's really a prayer, God who touches earth with beauty. Listen to these words, please, because they really are the prayer of our hearts if we want to change this world as we are changed by the Holy Spirit, God will touch us with his Holy Spirit to let us be victorious. God, is that God who touches us with God who touches us with beauty? No, that's a different one. The one I sent by Willie, is that the one you got? I'm sorry, God who touches earth with beauty? 
Okay. <laughs> God who touches earth with beauty. I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong. I'll just do it. I'll do it acupuncture. Okay. I'm sorry. It, I'm sorry. I thought I gave you the wrong one. I'm sorry, Susan. Give that woman a hand. She was willing to play the piano. God who touches earth with beauty. Make me lovely too, with your spirit recreate me, make my heart anew. Like the springs and running waters, make me crystal pure. Like the rocks of towering grandeur, make me strong and sure. Like the shining waves in sunlight, make me glad and free. Like the straightness of the pine trees, let me upright be. Like the arching of the heavens, lift my thoughts above. Turn my dreams to noble actions, ministries of love. God who touches earth with beauty, make me lovely too. Keep me ever by your spirit, pure and strong and true. That's the old version of that hymn. I guess this was a newer one. And, and I'm the one who gave her the book. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. You know, we sing it. It's really a simple prayer that God who touches everything with beauty would help us to be strong and true and pure and noble and truthful and righteous. And we can't do it alone. It has to be the power of God in us because we are humans and we're prone to the negative rather than the positive. But in Jesus Christ, remember, we have the gift of life and eternal life. And I want you to do this in closing. There's a post that goes upwards on the cross and there's a post that goes horizontal vertical and horizontal and if we reach up to God we also must reach out to other people let's pray together please. Father uh, may we think on these things the things that you would have us to do to be pure and right and honest and just and fair and truthful and Lord may we not do anything that would hurt your kingdom we are impure we sometimes are liars. We sometimes are dishonest. But Lord, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins. And I thank you today in Jesus' name that you would bless each of us as we seek to be your people. And I thank you for forgiving us and helping us in the name of Jesus Christ to be all the things that you would give us to think on that we can become the people of God. In Jesus' name, your word is so clear. And forgive us when we fail you or hurt each other. And Lord, I ask for forgiveness myself for the times I have hurt others or have hurt you. And I thank you for your divine loving care and forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ above all names. And in Jesus' name, we pray for every person today to be blessed and to be a blessing. In the name of Christ, all of God's children with thankful hearts said, amen. This morning, if you want to join this church, if you want to rededicate your life, if you want to recommit your life or make a profession of faith, we would welcome you gladly today as we worship God and sing together our closing hymn. May we stand together as we sing.